Okay, you guys, this is it. I've been waiting for years, I think it's safe to say, but really more months to make this video on my channel. Uh, I could probably talk about this forever, so I wrote some notes down to try to keep me on track and not ramble. I want to give you as much info as possible because this is a story about me, my life, that has flipped my world upside down and that is not exaggerating. <laughs> I, um, I want you to listen with gracious ears and really just remember this is my story. There's nothing to agree or disagree with because it's my story, it's my experience, it's my perspective, it's what I have believed and come out of versus me telling you this is right or this is wrong and that would allow you to agree or disagree. This is really just something to listen to, like possibly relate to, possibly not relate to. Either way, I hope you enjoy it. So I will f talk about my background re very quick because I want to get to the point. Um, and I have videos. I've been making videos for a decade on YouTube. So I will refer to several videos that if you want more info on, you can go and watch. My testimony is one of the first videos I ever made. I think it's the first video I ever, ever made. It's called Christianity is the Foundation of My Life. And then I also made one called my testimony my wedding story and testimony something like that so definitely check those out and then how I met my husband check that out as well um, but as far as my background goes I came from a loving home I was raised with the you know God was talked about but we didn't like live out any particular denomination or anything i guess catholicism was the most influential in my life we prayed rosaries and i did my catechism classes through the class the catholic church and took my first communion but i never like went to church or did anything with with catholicism so that's my background but i was always taught about the lord i always saw my grandma reading her bible we always prayed and i knew god was real i believed in god but i did not come to know Jesus as my Lord until I was about 16 and when I was 16 I was a sophomore in high school I was driving and so I started going to church and I went there for six years so during that time I was a new believer and that was my my entrance into the church right while i was at that church i remember the pastor saying things like you can't go wrong with john macarthur and i know that john macarthur was on the radio at lunchtime every day i think it was 12 30 on the christian radio station so i would listen to his show i listened to that for like over a year and in that process of listening to john macarthur every day on my lunch break i came to believe that I was learning more on that radio broadcast than I was at my church. And I started to feel like there was something more out there that I was missing because my church that I was attending was not as deep in the teaching. So I'm not, I'm not sure when, but at some point in that time frame, I learned why. And the reason was because John MacArthur was a Calvinist, a reformed pastor, and he was teaching from a reformed perspective. So I didn't know it, but I was being indoctrinated by John MacArthur. And through those three, four years, I became at some point, I, I really don't know when, because like I said, it was never presented to me. It was a slow indoctrination. I became a, a five point Calvinist. I believed in T, tulip, right? T, total depravity, not just that we're sinners, but also that you are unable to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. You cannot respond to the gospel. I also came to believe in unconditional election that God chose before the foundation of the world for reasons that we don't understand who he was going to save and did not choose the rest. And I was not taught double predestination. I was taught 
that, that he passes over or passes by the non-elect. Not necessarily that he chose to save some and damn some, but that he chose to save some and the rest were on their way to hell anyway. He just let them go where they were going to inevitably go anyway. So this is what I was taught. And then the lingo there, the phrasing there that you would always hear to make sense of that was we shouldn't be focused on why didn't he choose the rest we should be focused on the fact that he chose any of us because none of us deserve to be chosen so i get it that's a very clever argument and i see how it makes sense and why i bought into it but it's just not anything that i see in scripture so i believed that i even came to believe in l limited atonement that jesus only provided atonement for those that were chosen and I came to believe in irresistible grace, that if you are elect, if you are one of those chosen for salvation, when you hear the gospel, you will not be able to resist the grace. You will not be able to resist it and you will come inevitably because you are elect and then perseverance of the saints. If you are elect, you will persevere to the end and if you don't, then you probably weren't really ever a Christian. So I came to believe all these five points. And on top of that, I also came to believe in compatibilism, which is aside from the five points, the philosophical view of how God works. And the way that that has always been explained to me is God is sovereign, but God is sovereign didn't just mean God is supreme ruler above all things. It actually means He's supreme ruler above all things and everything that comes to pass is actually his will it has actually been pre-ordained pre-decreed before an eternity past everything including bad your sin other people's sin the fall everything evil you can name everything was predetermined pre-decreed pre-ordained by god for his glory for his own special purposes before the foundation of the world and it is actually his will it is what he wants and even though the future is set in stone there are no possibilities nothing could happen other than the way they are set and predetermined to occur even though that's true we are also free and the way that that was explained to me was you do what you want to do most and the way that that was explained is god has God causes you to freely do what you want to do most. And now on this side of things, of course, when I hear that, I'm just like, what? But at 20, I believed it, all of it. I was a 20 year old young lady with no family and limited experience in the real world. And I thought I was getting all this amazing, rich, incredible teaching from all these brilliant people. And I believed it. I believed all of it. I really did. So that is what I believed along with some other things, but I'm going to stick to Calvinism for this video. So fast forward, I move, I leave Florida and you've got to watch the, how I met my husband video to know the story there. Cause it's actually wonderful. And the Lord did a beautiful work in my life, but I moved to Florida to, uh, from Florida to Tennessee, I attended a, Christian University and at that point is when finally I was pretty much told you're a Calvinist and it was by her she asked me these questions I didn't know she was asking me about tulip and the way that I answered these questions she said at the end of them you're a Calvinist and I thought okay so I'm a Calvinist whatever that is I guess in my youthful mind and in my just carefree life is good mind i didn't care to figure out what in the world that meant or what other options there were but i just said okay i knew what i believed i knew why i believed what i believed and that's it i'm a calvinist so it wasn't this really hard thing to accept for me because unbeknownst to me i had already been indoctrinated where most people that i know not all but most people that i know come from a non-Calvinist home and then they're introduced to Calvinism later in their life and then they wrestle with it and they have such a hard time with it and then they finally come to a place where they feel like they just have to accept it because it's right there in the scriptures. They've got to take it and they just accept it. And then, you know, that's their story. My story is a little different. I was already a Calvinist when I got to this university and the big debate at the university is, are you Calvinist or Arminian? Which 
now I know those are not the only two options, but back then, that's how it was presented to me. So of course, I was a Calvinist. It was the cool thing to be a Calvinist, just so you know. It was the cool thing because it takes boldness, it takes a little thick skin, it takes like the capacity to be like, whatever, deal with it. You know, you, you don't like the way that sounds? Oh well for you, I can handle the tough truth, you can't. So it took that pride and arrogance that um, I liked. I liked it in Paul Washer, I liked it in John MacArthur, I liked it in R.C. Sproul, I liked it in Bodie Bauckham. Like these guys, they're great, they're brothers, and I view them as brothers but they have that in your face, bold deal with it kind of truth. And I like that, that appeals to my flesh. I am a very passionate person. So I do think that there is a sinful aspect to that for me personally, that I, it appealed to my flesh to be like, that's right, deal with that hard truth, you know? And I never debated Calvinism, I never did. I probably had one or two heated discussions at some point in college, but it was not a theme in my life. It was not something that came up often. I was just Calvinist, I knew I was, moving on. And you kind of look down at the Arminians. They were like, not as smart, not as willing to deal with the hard truth. There was a pride there. That's just the only way I can explain it. There really was a pride there. And you do look down. I, I looked down at whoever wasn't reformed. So the way that that was verbalized though, it was never like, can you believe them? They're so dumb. It was always, that's not very good teaching. That's not good teaching. And then when you would hear reformed teaching, you would say, this is good teaching. So <laughs> the code word was, this is good teaching, but really what you meant was, this is reformed teaching. And the not good teaching was, that's not reformed teaching. It's so funny. Now looking back, I see all of this, okay? I also remember, dis like really, really distinctively, I remember I went to a college group and the college leader, it was at a church, a local church. The college leader was reformed, so were all the college students, that's why we went there, but the church was not. And the pastor was super old and he was going to retire soon and this college leader was going to be the new pastor. And so we all knew what the plan was. He was going to eventually reform the church. And he said, give me five years. And we all knew it. We all knew what he meant. He didn't have to say, give me five years and then I'm going to slowly indoctrinate the church and make it a reformed church. But that's what we knew he meant. We knew it. But in our minds, it was a good thing because to us, reformed theology was right and true and it was scripture. So we were all for it. I didn't stop to think, man, that's wrong. <laughs> That's kind of wrong, you know, if they want reform teaching, they'll look for a reform pastor. If they don't know that you're a reform pastor, I hope you're going to be upfront with them about it so that they can decide whether they want that or not. Now I see it that way. That Back then I was like, that's right, get in there, get in there and, you know, change things up, make it reformed. Mm -mm, I don't I don't think that's right at this point. I think every human being on the planet deserves to know what the person that they are submitting under being taught by believes so that they know that they are in a safe place, right? Being taught things that they agree with. And as a young girl, when I was listening to John MacArthur every day, I didn't even think of this, but I do wish that I had known and I wish that I had gone and double check things in the scripture. Maybe I wouldn't have noticed, but at least I own this. I didn't go and double check things and I should have because maybe I wouldn't have agreed with what he was saying and comparing it to what was in the scriptures. I don't know, but the truth is once you're fed a lens to view things through, it's really hard to look at the scriptures and not see it through that lens that you've already been given to see it through, right? So we all do that. Even now I find myself doing that. So anyway, did that. Then I got married. I My husband came to Tennessee with me and we went to the same college or the university that was Calvinism or Arminianism. And we were in our New Testament class together. And I remember that at this point, both of us already knew we are reformed, we're Calvinists, we knew that. I don't remember how, I know that both of us were indoctrinated by John MacArthur because we both listened to John MacArthur for four years. And 
we he went to John MacArthur's College and Seminary in California for six months before we were reunited in Tennessee to get married. And while he was there and while I was here, we would talk on the phone. And I was like, I'm learning this, I'm learning that. And he was learning the same stuff. So both of us were being reformed. <laughs> and it was great. It was great. I, I, I viewed it as a wonderful thing. And I was very happy. And the Lord had us on the same page, which is great. Then we got married, he moved here, we went to class. And I remember in this class, it was New Testament survey and the professor was not reformed. And I remember going with an open mind, ready to hear the other side. I guess at this point, I knew there was another side. I don't remember. It wasn't that big of a deal to me. But I remember going ready on Romans nine day. Like, what's he gonna say? What's the other side think of Romans 9, you know? And whatever he said, it did not convince me. I left there like, that was some, you know, just weak argumentation. I was not persuaded at all. If anything, it just confirmed how right the reformed view of Romans 9 was. Because it was weak. And I left there and I never, ever looked into it had another opportunity to hear Romans 9 presented from another vantage point. I just knew I'm totally Calvinist and I'm done, you know, hearing that side. And what about my life? We found a reformed church. We immediately plugged in. The people were God sent amazing people, lots of young couples. We were brand newlyweds. I mean, we were married one month when we got to our church. And so we like lived life together with these people, had our children there. Everything was peachy, I'll just say. And of course our lives, you know, we've had jobs, we dropped out of college, all these things happened along those years. But in a nutshell, we had a glorious 15 years at this church newlyweds, first child, second child. I'm a stay at home mother. I got to homeschool. Life was grand and beautiful and amazing. The only two times during that whole time before I was challenged by my friend about Calvinism um, that I remember talking to my husband or thinking to myself anything that challenged Calvinism was one night, I remember we were in our, in our room, it was after the kids had gone to bed, and I don't know what brought the conversation on, but I remember that I was asking him, so that all my sin was predetermined by God? Like, I don't understand, why? Why would God predetermine me to be out of his will? I was so confused by that. And I don't remember what he said, but whatever he said, it was enough for me to be like, Okay, and it was probably something along the lines of whatever God wants is what happens because ultimately everything is his will. So even though you're out of his will, it is his will because it is part of his plan and you can't, he's, he, you can't thwart his plan, something like that. I, I don't remember, but that's probably what he said and we both believed that. So it was one of those critical thinking moments that I disregarded and pushed to the back of my mind and just kept on, you know, nursing, making baby food, changing diapers and raising babies and didn't have time to think about those things. Then a few years later, I remember reading the gospel to my children. We started with little children Bibles, which I love. We did big picture storybook Bible and the Jesus storybook Bible love them both. But then we graduated to the actual Bible and I would read the gospels and Proverbs and Acts and the Old Testament. And we were reading in the gospel one day and I remember reading Jesus words. And I remember thinking in my own head, I didn't say this out loud to anyone. I thought this sounds like everyone has the opportunity to come to Jesus. <laughs> that was my thought. And then right after that, I thought, when am I going to teach my kids about election? And I thought, how strange. And then I just pushed it to the back of my mind and kept changing diapers and kept making baby food and kept raising babies, you know? Moving on with life, too busy to stop and think about that. So that happened. Then 
I also, this, this is for sure one way that I was, I was trying to think like, how have I seen these, this mindset play out in my life? Because for the most part, I am a very, very intentional person. So every day I live with great purpose and I teach my children and I devote my life to making sure that they um, have the word in their life every day, that we pray every day, that they are loved and cherished and that they know we're on their side and all these things that I do with great intention for my husband and for my children out of love because I feel like it actually counts and makes a difference for their futures, right? In shaping who they are. So that is not very consistent with determinism. And I know that I will get backlash for calling it determinism. So I just want to explain something. Compatibilism. Compatibilism is the sovereignty of God and God is sovereign and man is free, right? Have you ever heard that? God is sovereign and man is responsible. God is sovereign and man is blameworthy. So the reason there's tension there is because they contradict. That's why there's tension. So what you're calling compatible, these things are compatible. They're actually not. That's why it's called compatibilism because it's claiming that even though these two things contradict completely, we're going to say that they are compatible somehow, some way they are compatible. So there's a, an appeal to mystery, which I did this. I said this. So I believed this. I said, God has, I believed and I would say God has decreed all things yet somehow still man's free. Man is still blameworthy for his sin and all the things he's done wrong, even though they couldn't have done otherwise, even though there's no possibilities, everything is set in stone, everything's been predetermined and predecreed. Somehow, man is still responsible. I would appeal to mystery. I believed this. I accepted this, okay? So I'm saying that just to say what compatibilism is and that I understand it and that I accepted it. And one of the ways it played out in my life was when we got our vasectomy which I have a video about our vasectomy story. I highly encourage you to watch it. So when we were thinking about getting our vasectomy, we did not listen to the other side at all, which I regret immensely, but you'll hear all that part. I'm just gonna give you the bullet points and you can hear the deeper story if you choose to watch the video. But the reasons we gave each other and ourselves for having our vasectomy with a you know clear conscience was we're free in Christ. You can't thwart God's plan. If we do this, then obviously it was part of God's plan. And that's how the sovereignty belief, accepting that there is no choice, really, there's no possibilities, really, whatever we really do is just part of God's plan anyway. That mentality manifested in our life through our vasectomy. And I think that's probably the biggest example I can give. Most other areas of our life, we don't live like we believe that. We live like our life is actually making a difference. Our life is actually important and we can create good things and bad things with our decisions, you know? So that's one example that I just wanted to share. So fast forward, that was my life. It stayed that way for a long time. Fast forward three-ish years ago. It was Thanksgiving weekend. So this is funny. I was thinking about this the other day and I was like, I bet you that my messenger conversation with my friend that challenged me is still there. We've never talked through messenger again. We've only talked through Voxer. So I went to my messenger and I looked her up and sure enough, the last message we exchanged on messenger was her initial message to me right after I posted a John Piper sermon on Facebook and I invited dialogue. She messaged me. I sent her two voice clips and then we switched over to Voxer and we talked on Voxer for like days. Okay. So I actually went to Voxer. I looked up our thread and I, I, I scanned or I scrolled all the way back to November, 2019. And I listened to our conversation and it was like, it felt like the twilight zone for me because I heard myself saying all of my Calvinistic beliefs and that feels so long ago. It was crazy. So my, so fa my favorite part about my conversation with my friend was how peaceful it was. It was so real 
and objective, you know? It wasn't emotional and argumentative. It was, let's look at this thing together and examine it together and challenge what each other sees in this thing. And we're seeking for truth. We're not seeking to be right, we're seeking for truth. So I posted this John Piper sermon, the seashells sermon, which I love to this day. It is so amazing. And she messaged me. Pretty much in the message, she, her approach was, I've been studying Calvinism and Arminianism and I've been, da -da -da -da. it was pretty long. And she was like, the, I wanted to ask you about the sermon that you posted because you invited discussion. And so I wanted to ask you about how you feel about his beliefs because he believes in reprobation. He believes that some are elect for salvation and some are elect for damnation. And so if he believes that, then why would he be talking about this couple that wasted their retirement collecting seashells when they couldn't have done otherwise? Like that has been decreed before the foundation of the world that that is what they would do. So why would he look down on that or talk bad about it? They're obviously reprobates elected for hell with that being their set in stone life. And then the ladies that he's praising for dying on the mission field, well, they were elect for salvation. And that was their road in life before the foundation of the world. So why is he praising them? You know, like you can't really say anything bad about somebody who's just doing what they were predetermined to do. So this was her question to me. And I listened to some of my messages in response to her and you know, it was like, hey girl, how are you? You know, uh, I haven't heard from you in so long. It's great to talk. Yes, I definitely want to talk about this. And in my first message to her, I said, I'm Calvinist to the bone. That's what I told her. Ah, it was so hard to hear that, but that's what I told her. And I said, for sure, we can talk about this whenever you want, but let's talk on Voxer. So that was the end of the Messenger discussion. And so I went to my Voxer. Since I had the date from Messenger, I knew that it was around November, 20, 20th, 2019. So I went to Voxer and I scrolled, 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 scrolled forever. And I have Voxer Pro, so I can scroll for super long past messages. And I found November 22nd, 2019. And then before that was like February, 2016. So I knew this is it, this is the conversation. So she messaged me first and it was like 15 minutes long. And then she messaged me again and then I, was dialoguing with her and it was again a beautiful situation there was like no emotion just real conversation like oh you have some great questions i don't know and i was saying things like i believe this and i believe that and i believe this and then i was you know saying the scriptures that i was always referring to romans 1 for total depravity romans 3 for total depravity um romans 9 vessels of wrath um, Joseph and the brothers and God meant it for you, what you meant for evil, God meant for good and the ax in God's hand and Amos and all these passages, Acts, uh, 1348, I think it is Ephesians one, of course. And I'm saying all these passages to her and she's coming back with questions about those passages. And then I start sending her pictures of my systematic theology book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I start sending her YouTube videos of snippets of John Piper saying something or Bodhi Bauckham saying something or John MacArthur saying something and then her taking the time to watch those things. Oh my goodness. And then answering back and challenging me with this or that. And during all this dialogue, I remember thinking, I totally agree with everything that John Piper just said in this video. How can she not agree? Like I remember thinking these things. And when she would respond to me, I remember thinking like, no, she just doesn't get it. You know, she just doesn't get it. So then I'd send her something else and she'd respond. I'm like, no, she just doesn't get it. So I do remember the moment, like I couldn't believe how long we talked. The amount of messages, you know, it was like in between our life. We both stayed home moms. So as I would listen, I couldn't believe how, how great we talked together it was such a blessing to my heart to know like there are people out there like that that can dialogue back and forth even if they disagree and the fact that she hung with me i cannot talk too long about this person in my life and how they just hung with me hung with me hung with me hung with me but without being brought to tears and gratitude like that means so much to me and 
her approach is probably what made it so wonderful because we never became argumentative. Although there were many messages that she would say, I'm sorry if I sound passionate, I'm not mad. And I would be like, oh no girl, you're fine. You know, like we were just dialogue. But I remember the moment because what I kept telling her was we're haters of God, we're haters of God, right? And I do think when you come out of Calvinism, you realize what your main hangups were, right? Like the things that were really, really holding, holding you there. I think total depravity was mine. I was so convinced of total depravity. And again, total depravity is not just we're sinners. Everybody believes we're sinners. I mean, the Bible says we're sinners. What's unique in Calvinism is we're not just sinners, but you cannot even acknowledge your sin and say, I need a savior. Yes, I want that God you just told me about. You can't do that unless God chose you before the foundation of the world. If you're not elect, you are incapable of realizing your need for a savior. You are incapable of saying, I hear that good news and I believe it and I want it. You can't do that. And Calvinism, total depravity means that. So the line I would always say is, I would never have chosen God if he had not chosen me. I would never, I would go to hell. I was born a hater of God. So that was what really, really had me. And so I kept saying haters of God. And I remember her asking me, where do you see that we're haters of God, that we're born haters of God? And I was like, Romans 1. So I went to Romans 1 and I We'll do a video after this one talking about my journey through the scriptures, but I just want to share my story first. When I read Romans 1 and I saw that it said, those who are suppressing the truth become hard-hearted and darkened in their hearts, and then they become all these things, bam, 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 haters of God. I remember the moment I read that, I felt this this chill of fear that just came through my whole body. And I said to myself, what if I'm wrong? That was the moment, the moment. And who did it? Scripture. So I found that message and I was able to hear myself. It was crazy. I was able to hear myself say, well, I always thought this said we're born haters of God, but in reading it, I see that it's talking about you become these things if you suppress the truth. Like these are the unrighteous people. And it was literally like a 35 second message. That's all I said. You know, I was like freaking out in my room. <laughs> like what is happening here? So that was like the beginning of everything, that moment. And then she hung with me. Like I just kept going through my journey. I started going through the scriptures and all of that. So it became a roller coaster of emotions, of course. When I realized, okay, I am not a Calvinist. After my journey through scripture, I went to Calvinistic systematic theology books. I did not go to the internet. I did not go to blogs, I did not go to videos, I did not go to people, I did not go to articles. I went strictly to the systematic theology books written by Calvinists and I wrote down every passage that they said proved to total depravity to be biblical. Then I went to all those scriptures and then I did the same thing for you and L and I and P. Then I did the same thing for the order of salvation. I did the same thing for reprobation. I did the same thing for faith not being uh, a work. I did the same thing for sovereignty and compatibilism and free will, libertarian free will and compatibilistic free will. I knew these things from sitting in Sunday school for the last 17 years in a reformed church. So I knew these terms. I have done theology classes in college and at church. So I knew these things, but I re-dug into everything. And after I went through that, which took me like four days, it was Thanksgiving weekend. I was so happy because I didn't have to do anything. Hector was off, my mom was off. I was in my room with my Bible like a maniac, okay? And after four days, I knew I'm not a Calvinist. I am not a Calvinist. None of these things are lining up with scripture. None of the things I thought I believed 
are actually what the Bible is saying, right? So that's that. And that's when the roller coaster of emotions began. I, I mean, I felt everything. I felt anger. I felt blindsided and like brainwashed by Joe MacArthur. I was so angry, not at him, nor was I ever angry at a person. I was always angry at the situation and myself. Myself for not going to the scriptures and studying. Myself for not checking and double checking things. Myself for just believing what I was told. And that really broke my heart. I would cry and cry. And then I would think about how this man would just like indoctrinated me without telling me what he believed. Like that was pretty upsetting. And then you just have to realize, you know what? At least I'm here now. And, and, and I would be thankful. And then I would be overwhelmed with gratitude to God for the new picture I had of him in my heart and my mind. That he wasn't just this angry God and only saved some and he only loved some, but he actually loved everyone and wants everyone. And there's all these passages that talk about his character as he desires that none would perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay, switching to my phone now because the camera died again. So... Now the journey begins, right? Now it was like, what do I do? <laughs> and although I was not in cage stage when I became or discovered, found out that I was a Calvinist and that most people were not, this was different. This, I do think I entered into cage stage, but not right away. I think in the beginning, I was ecstatic. I felt like I found the good news again. In fact, I hopped on YouTube and made a live video way too soon, just like ranting in excitement about, I'm not a Calvinist anymore. A few local people saw it and they told me that I sounded like I had just come to Christ again. That's what they viewed it as. Leighton Flowers commented on it. He said, uh, welcome to the other side. I guess someone posted it on his page. I had never seen a Leighton Flowers video yet to that point. So my friend that helped, that walked with me through that whole time, she was like, Leighton Flowers commented on your comments. And I was like, who's that? And she goes, he has this whole channel about Calvinism. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. So that's the first time I saw any of his videos was after I came out of Calvinism. And even then, my husband advised me and he was right. And I was very cautious to not just go and do the same thing on the other side and like just take in all this information from the other view or other views instead of just scripture. So I set out to reread the whole New Testament and I started from Genesis, um, just reading slowly through the Old Testament, but read the entire New Testament. And every time I finish the New Testament, I just start again. So I read one gospel, then I start at Acts to the end. Then I read the next gospel, start at Acts to the end. That's pretty much what I've been doing for the last three years. And I'm like in Deuteronomy right now, slowly going through the Old Testament. So it's been quite a journey. I am significantly more familiar with the New Testament than I was before. And I still feel like every time I read through it, there's more, you know, that I missed or that I forgot. It's like, a never ending treasure is the word of God, right? Um, so I waited about six months, six to seven months before I spoke to any friends about it. Um, I didn't know what to do. I felt nervous and scared, but also super excited. And, and when I say any friends, I did tell my best friend, she just started laughing. I was like, we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. I just have to tell somebody I'm not a Calvinist anymore. And she just started laughing. She was like, what is a Calvinist? And I was like, girl, you go to a Calvinist church for 10 years. What are you talking about? So that was hilarious. And so, you know, for the longest time, she thought I was just like making a big deal out of just semantics. And it wasn't until she took her deep dive study about a year ago 
that she realized, oh no, this is not just semantics. This is like a ginormous deal. And she realizes now why it was such a big deal to me. But it took her like a year and a half before telling me like, okay, now I see why you are so like passionate about this, right? So that video I made on my channel live and immediately I took it down right away. My husband was like, babe, what are you doing? You know, no, we, we just figured out we're not Calvinists. We're in a Calvinist church. We're not just going to start putting stuff online. I was like, you're right. You're right. I'm just so excited. So we took it down. Didn't speak to anybody like besides my best friend and maybe like two, two other close, close people. And then about six to seven months later, I brought it up to somebody else. And then I brought it up to somebody else and I brought it up to somebody else. And little by little, I talked to about 10 people over the course of a year. And I have to say, one of the biggest, first of all, I made a lot of mistakes. I'm just gonna say that on the front end. So I'm sure this has a lot to do with it. I made a lot of mistakes on my approach. I was very emotional. Sometimes I was angry with some people, not them, but my, presentation or my approach was anger with some people I was overwhelming with some people I was um just whatever you know just not not the approach that would invite conversation you know and so I made a lot of mistakes I also had some good conversations too I was very surprised to see how this was not something that was going to be easy to discuss with people I I was probably the biggest thing I was surprised about in the beginning, in my naive little brain, I truly thought that I was going to chat with my friends about something that they were going to realize just like I did. And of course, no, they all come from different backgrounds and histories on how they became Calvinists and why they're Calvinists. So, you know, that didn't go as well as I wanted it to, but again, I made some mistakes and I just had so many emotions. It was a roller coaster. Um, and I didn't realize like, or I didn't stop to think, obviously seven months of me going through this, walking through every topic to just like unload on one person all at once. How can it go any different, you know? <laughs> so, it's interesting, like some people were like, we can't ever talk about this again, never bring it up again. Okay, some people were like, we're gonna talk about this again, and they never brought it up again. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Some people called me unteachable, which is probably the funniest one of all, because obviously I'm very teachable since I just turned around and changed my mind about something that I believed in for 17 years because scripture told me otherwise. I think that's pretty teachable. I mean, I would say that's very teachable. So that's funny. Some people were like, maybe you never really were a Calvinist, which that's hilarious too, because obviously I was. Um, some people called me Pelagian, semi-Pelagian. Some people said it was, you know, heresy or unorthodox or, um, just all these things. It's just so interesting. Instead of discussing the topic at hand, it's like labels. It's like, stop calling me stuff and let's talk about this, <laughs> you know? But, you know, people, we're all fearful. We're all fearful. And when we have, when we hold to an ideology as, or something that's like our identity, to question that is scary. It is scary, especially when you have a lot uh, invested into it, you know? It is scary to invest in something for so long and then say, oh, I'm wrong. Turn around and start from scratch. My mentality, however, is if, it's, if we're talking about truth, then who cares what you lose? Who cares? I don't, you know? But that is also coming from someone who was just a stay-at-home wife and my children were young and I hadn't, you know, done anything huge regarding Calvinism. So it was easy to walk away from it and say, oh, I was wrong for 17 years. For someone else that's got a lot more invested in it, I can see how it could be extremely scary, extremely humbling 
to the point where you don't want to go there. So I, I get it. You know, there's grace there. Even with all the different reactions I've gotten from people, there's grace. There is grace. I have not felt any bitterness, resentment, frustration, anger towards any person at any point in this. So I'm very thankful for that. It's been a very objective experience for me. It's the topic that I have had issues with. I tried to wait, like after I had those interactions with people that I know and love, I took a break. I realized, man, this is not how it, I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> so I had done some damage. I had hurt feelings. I had offended some. I had posted stupid things on Facebook, not a lot, but enough to like get people's attention. Like what's happening with Alana, you know, I'm sure. Not that anyone ever said anything to me about it. I'm just assuming that. That's another thing that's been hard is like, there's only been like one or two people that have approached me about anything. Nobody else has, and that's fine. There's fear, I know, and there's grace there and understanding. But, um, you know, I posted some, I remember a video about John MacArthur talking about how God doesn't love everybody. And I remember watching the video, video by him and being so disgusted. I was like, this is horrifying. I want people to see this so they can see how wrong this doctrine is. Nobody on my Facebook even knows what's happening. So for me to post that out of nowhere made no sense. And I see that now. And I also have learned that not all social media platforms are the same. YouTube's different. <laughs> I have a family here on YouTube. You guys know me, you get me. You've been following me for 11 years. You understand me. You you take my heart as genuine. You don't think I'm just putting on a, a facade. Like you get me. And so I can talk and not necessarily have to explain everything to you every single time. But Facebook, I'm barely on there. And it's used differently than YouTube is used. And so I've learned the hard way, not with a bunch of mistakes, but maybe two or three mistakes on Facebook and it's okay. You know, I know that there's grace on me and all I can do is say, Lord, forgive me and move on, you know, and learn from that and not do it again. So that's been hard. And then to recover from that, I really do think the Lord has just laid all the timing out perfectly so that there was time for me to recover from that. There was time for me to apologize to people that I love and that even though I didn't intend to hurt or offend, I was able to apologize to them. And I got nothing but forgiveness and love in return. I got, um, you know, even most of them, with the exception of like one person, everybody said, oh, there's nothing to apologize about. I didn't get upset. Like you, I know you, we were just talking. It's okay, but thank you. That was the most, the majority of the people responded in that way. And there was like one or two people that, that were like, thank you so much. And then one that was like, you hurt me, thank you. So praise God, I was able to, you know, have time to recover from the Facebook mistakes, recover from the bad interactions that I messed up with, apologize to those, be forgiven. And then just a time of silence and quiet. But I have done interviews on YouTube and I needed an outlet, you guys. <laughs> so how do I feel about those decisions to make those interviews? I don't know. I never really know. I don't know. Like I've gone back and forth about it a million times and that's probably an indicator that I probably shouldn't have done them. I don't regret it. I don't think I did this terrible wrong thing. I just think the timing may have been off, but I really, really wanted an outlet and it wasn't on my channel. So I thought maybe people won't see it, but I think people did, you know? And who knows who did? Because again, no one comes to me to say, hey, I watched that. <laughs> Let's talk about it. I have some questions. So who knows who has seen it? I don't know and I may never know and that's okay, you know? Um, so how do I feel about them? I think that the Susan Morales interview was well done. I really like it. I, however, have wondered who ha what have people felt when they've watched it, you know? And worried about that because I love my people. And I've also did the interview with Idol Killer, which 
I feel insecure about that one. I feel like I didn't do as good of a job in that interview, but still the Lord can use it and he has, but still I wonder who has seen that and what did they think and how did they feel? And so because of that second guessing, I just wonder if it was the best decision or not, but I've learned from it and there's grace, you know? I even had him take it down for a little while because I was in a panic. I was like, can you please take this down? Just like until I tell you because I was in a panic and he was so gracious to take it down. And then like three weeks later, I was like, put it back up. Like, it's okay. I am just panicking, you know? Um, but I'm grateful for his graciousness to me to have honored that um, in my up and down emotional roller coaster, you know? Um, so it's been, you know, hard for many reasons. And then also just the constant turmoil on the inside, like, am I making too big of a deal of this? Is this as big of a deal as I think it is? And all those questions and Lord, am I, am I, you know, what do you want me to do with this Lord? And, um, how do I, how do I go about moving forward with all of this? It's hard. It's hard. And I think having my dear friends that have walked through this with me as a sounding board has been very good. And then also just constantly going to the Lord about it has been very good. Um, I've made videos and taken them down because in the moment I feel like they're a great idea. And then afterwards I'm like, this was a bad idea. I do think that a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was still attending a reformed church. So it makes sense that maybe I shouldn't be posting stuff that goes against the teaching of the church that I go to, right? But as of a month ago, we were no longer at our church. And, you know, it was years of coming to that decision. It was a slow, long, prayerful, thought out, tons of discussions between me and Hector, lots of prayer, effort to stay and just focus on worship and fellowship, effort to just focus on the incredible people and how much we love them and to cover everything with love and grace. And it just wasn't working. It was never about the people. It's just about the doctrine. And, you know, when your heart is not somewhere anymore because of your differences, then of course it's the right thing to do to move on. But man, it came at a big cost. You know, my husband loves music and being in the music ministry and he's done that for 16 years there. And it was a hard thing to let that go. And I have become a wife, a mother of two, a homeschool mom. I have learned everything that I know about marriage and motherhood because of my community at this church. And I have left. So it is, a, is it, a, it is at a high cost that we left, but it was the right thing to do. And it was not, it was not easy for the longest time, but there came a point where it was crystal clear, like we have to go and we're going to be okay. The Lord is with us. We are his children. He is with us. He's going to guide us. He's going to take care of us. And so that peace that wasn't there forever is there now. And that's when we knew, okay, we're ready. It's time. Up until that point, the fear was crippling at the thought of leaving. And so there came a point where the fear was gone and total trust came in. So where am I today? I have never thought that Calvinists are not brothers and sisters in the Lord. I have always known that they are because I was a Christian as a Calvinist for 17 years. And so was my husband. And I've walked with these people for 17 years. I have not encountered personally the stereotypical, proud, arrogant, rude Calvinists. All the Calvinists I know are wonderful. They're loving and gracious. They have been dear friends and just wise counselors. I love 
all the Calvinists I know. Um, I believe they're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Completely believe that because I know I loved Jesus. My life was devoted to Jesus when I was a Calvinist. But I also think I was mistaken in the way I was interpreting scripture about who God is and the work of Jesus. And I do believe that anyone that believes Jesus did not die for the whole world is failing to take many, many passages at their plain reading. And I do think that there was a lot of philosophy in Calvinism. There was a lot of logical, clever arguments that are not biblical. And I believed them all, I bought them all, but now I see where I went wrong. I think that there is a lot of historical data that is very important to know about who Augustine was, who Calvin was, how Calvinism the theology came to enter the church and where its origins are from. That's really important. I didn't know that. Uh, even in my Christian uh, courses from college, books that I had, the information was there. It says plainly, Augustine is known as having been the first person to bring in Platonic Greek philosophy into and mix it up with theology and bring it into the church. So this whole concept of determinism and compatibilism mixed up with theology in the church is from Greek philosophy. And knowing that should make us stop for a second and be like, what, what, wait a minute, what? Like it's from Plato and from Augustine and he was a Gnostic for 10 years before he became a Christian. And so he brought in all this stuff. It's good to know that it's important to know that that's from the world of philosophy. And we've brought that into the church and our church fathers are not church history guys. They are Paul and Peter and James and John. Those are the church. Those are the people that we need to be looking at. And just to see like how much Jesus says and how much Paul says that totally do not fall in line with Calvinism or determinism. And they imply free will constantly when you read Genesis and my goodness, Exodus and Leviticus and all the clear cut choices and options that God gives with consequences and reward on either end. Those all imply choice. I mean, even just Cain and Abel, when God tells Cain, if you do this, you know, this is going to happen. But if you do this, this is going to happen. You must master the sin that's crouching at your door. We must take God seriously. Like he's telling him that because he means that Cain can actually do something about it. And so just these conversations that God has and the way that God presents himself in scripture, revisiting that, it's very eye-opening. He means what he says and he says what he means and he's not a trickster and he's not confusing. And so that, I also think it is super important to hear the arguments against what you believe, the experts for the other side. If you only hear your side, your side, your side, your side, your side, echo chamber, all that does is validate, validate, validate what you already think is true and you don't ever even think about the other side. It is so wise to hear all perspectives and the other side because what if you're wrong, you know? So these things really, really were good for me to expose myself to. After I knew I wasn't a Calvinist, after I knew um, I've seen these scriptures this way, but actually I see them this way now. That's when I started to hear Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson and um, Mike Winger and who else? Idol Killer. And I really, really, I found Leighton Flowers to be exceedingly helpful for proof texts. When I saw a pastor that had been a Calvinist and come out of Calvinism 
share his story on Leighton Flowers' channel. He mentioned Kevin Thompson, and that's when I went to see Kevin Thompson. And there were a lot of things that he said that I had already on my own come to realize. One thing he said was there's no gospel in Calvinism. And I thought I already came to that conclusion because gospel means good news. So if you're elect, you're elect. That's your saving. That's where your hope and salvation is. If you're not elect, there's no good news. You're doomed no matter what. And I had already come to that conclusion. So watching his videos were very validating for me, but also there was some videos that, man, it felt like somebody was just punching me in the stomach over and over again. Um, particularly the election is nothing like what they told you and predestination is nothing like what they told you. Those videos helped me realize that I would read the scriptures and whenever I saw the word chosen or the word elect or the word predestined, I didn't say predestined for what and then read it in the text or chosen for what and then read it in the text. But instead, I was bringing with me chosen for salvation. Even though it didn't say that, I was injecting it and that's how I was seeing the text. And I realized how much injecting of doctrine I had been doing as I was reading the scriptures. So even if I was reading the Bible, since I was reading it through this lens and with all these doctrines that I was bringing with me, injecting, injecting, I was failing to see the plain reading because I wasn't reading it plainly. I was bringing stuff. So it was really, really interesting to watch some of his videos. And, you know, I'm continuing on my journey. I love where I am today. I feel peace. I feel trust. I feel faithful that God's with us. He's holding us. I'm so thankful that my kids are hearing and seeing us be humble, that we believed something, we realized we were wrong according to scripture, and we're, you know, embarking on following where the Lord is guiding us. I'm thankful that my children are going to be raised with the message that Jesus loves everybody and there's hope for anybody and everyone to come to Christ. And I'm thankful that um, we are on the same page. That's a very big deal. So there's a lot of good that's come out of this. There has been some hard things, but I think that in the grand scheme, this is, this is a huge, a huge thing. And so it's worth, as, as sad as it is, it's worth the things we've lost. So yeah, that's where I am today. I am planning on making a part two, taking you through the journey, through the scriptures that I went through as much as I can remember. And, um, giving you an idea of where I was before, how I saw certain texts before, and how I see them now. And so that's my plan for the next video. I know this was long. Thank you so much for watching and hearing my story. I encourage you to go check out the videos I mentioned. I'll do my best to put the links for those in the description box so you can just go check them out when you have time. And thanks for listening to my story. I hope that you see my heart in it. I strive to be gracious and vulnerable and real and honest with you and with myself. And I know that there's so much I don't know, but I am okay with that because I trust the Lord will show me. And I'm just thankful for where he has me right now. Thank you guys. See you next time.